Today from the Napa Valley in the wine country of Northern California near Sonoma, we come to you from Sears Point Raceway for the California Grand Prix. And today we feature the three-hour IMSA Endurance Championship. Hi everybody, I'm Gary Lee. A beautiful, sunny, warm day and three hours of competition featuring four divisions. Now one division is the Grand Sport. There's a great points battle going on. Joe Vardy is eight points up on John Heinrichsey. Interestingly enough, the last time out was a 24-hour event that Vardy did not run, and Heinrichsey actually won the event. But Dave Hobbs joins us now, and David, there was a problem after the race. Well, as is so often the case in big-time racing, there was an official protest after they felt the fuel pickup was malfunctioning in some way. The team said this didn't really help them one little bit in their fuel economy, but however, they were disqualified. They have appealed. They may get those points back, which would vault them into a big lead. So look for a lot of exciting races today as they try and get those points back anyway. Well, of course, Heinrichsy is in a Pontiac, Vardy's in a turbo Mazda, but they're not favored to win. The favored car is a BMW. The BMW Grand Sport car, they maintain they can go through this three-hour race with just one fuel stop. And if that's the case, they're running very fast anyway, they should re pick up the lead in this championship. Now, the reason they're doing so well is this track is very difficult. Two and a half miles, 12 turns, a lot of elevation change, uses a lot of fuel. They maintain the BMW is better on fuel. We have two reporters covering pit lane right now. Let's take you to Greg Creamer, and he's standing by with the guy who will start that BMW from the pole position. Kelly, starting on the inside of the front row, obviously, your knowledge of this track had to be key. I mean, you spent a lot of time on this track as an instructor for Skip Barber. Uh, that's absolutely correct. Uh, from years of experience driving on this racetrack, I've... Uh, been uh, it's it's come naturally to me to drive around here uh, very near or at the limit of a race car where some racetracks uh, you have to really think about it and it can get a little spooky at sometimes here it just uh, came very naturally for me four cars in the in the top four four different manufacturers models all very close what's going to make the difference in this race uh, I think uh, stamina as far as the automobile is concerned this is a handling and braking track the BMW is phenomenal as far as uh, it can endure three hours of this kind of punishment. From what I understand, I just found out from good sources that this is the first time that an M3 has been on the pole in an IMSA Endurance Championship race since 1989, and I'm just happy that I could do it for the uh, Grand Prix Motorsports team. And of course, fuel is going to be one of those concerns as well. This car supposedly is, as David said, very good on fuel. Now there's a car right next door with a couple of drivers that want to keep this team honest. They're standing by with Cal. And the other guy in the front row is Jason Priestley, who's really starting a new career here. I'm sure, Jason, you're used to the pressure of your acting career, but this is a whole new ball game for you. What's it like sitting at the front of the pack with 60 other cars behind you? Uh, well, it's, it's great to be sitting at the, at the front of the pack. I'm usually sitting, uh, you know, about 10 or 15 spots behind this. Uh, we've had a great weekend. We were real lucky with the setup of the car, and, uh, you know, we're looking forward to a great race. Well, it's going to be interesting to see how his nerves hold up. We've got a lot of experienced drivers right behind him, and this is going to be a tough race for this young man. The drivers are in the car, strapping in. We're about to go racing with the three-hour IMSA Endurance Championship from uh, Sears Point Raceway here in Sonoma, California. So David Hobbs, Greg Creamer, Calvin Fish, and Gary Lee here to bring you all the action. We'll come back with the starting lineup and the start of this three-hour endurance. Stay with us. Welcome back to Sears Point Raceway here in Sonoma, California. You can see the cars are on the racetrack. They'll be uh, lining up. We'll give you the grid now. The front row, we talked to both of them, Kelly Collins in 62, Jason Priestley from Hollywood in car number 46. In the second row, we have Joe Vardy, who is leading the point standings in car number 70, and Morel Cochran in car number 3. In the third row, there's Stu Hayner in 32, and Mitch Wright in number 1. And moving now to the fourth row, that is uh, Kohler, John Kohler in number 47, and that is Craig Conway in number two. As we take a look at the rest of the starting lineup, we can tell you the top 18 drivers were all in the Grand Sport class. The fastest qualifier in sport was Chris Wilson in a prelude. The fastest qualifier in the uh, touring class was John Green in another prelude. And the fastest in the uh, compact class was Dave Daughtery, and he's in a Nissan 240ZX. So three hours, David Hobbs, they call this the Endurance Championship, but by comparison, the last outing was 24. Most teams will only use two drivers. This is really a sprint race. Well, it is, but of course, it's a lot of turns here, as we've already pointed out. You know, you've got 12 turns around here, um, just two and a half miles. It's a very hot afternoon. It's up in the high 80s. Uh, there's not much humidity, admittedly, 
but even so it's a very very physical track a lot of gear shifting a lot of elevation change and that you don't get a moment of peace that what you're seeing there now from the Goodyear bridge up to the hairpin where we're at that's about as long a straight piece as you're going to get in this whole two and a half miles so uh, obviously you're extremely busy around here but someone that can probably tell us a bit more about that is one of the drivers who's going to be going down in about half an hour David Murray David you just tell us how busy you are out there Really hard on, on being able to put the power down in addition to making the transition because you have a lot of transitions left to right and back and forth and so forth. And then, you know, the track's slippery enough to be able to have to put the power down. The bigger cars are, are really tearing the asphalt up, which is pushing the, the, the debris, the marbles, if you will, on the outside of the track. So passing in some places is going to be a little more difficult, yeah, particularly turn six. And as the three hours goes on, of course, that passing gets more and more difficult as that uh, debris and gravel build up. Right, and these cars, are so many cars, it's so competitive, and a lot of impatient drivers are going to want to go out that way. So it's well, going to be pretty exciting. Big speed differential, so a lot of people are going to be wanting to overtake slower moving cars where they probably wouldn't normally, and uh, they're going to get onto those marbles. So we're going to see a lot of action here this afternoon. David Murray's team driver, Burrell Cochran, starting outside the second row in car number three. Of course, David himself, an eight-time winner in endurance competition. He's won the Grand Sports Class Championship back in 1994, and uh, he'll be with us for a few minutes anyway before uh, that first pit stop. You're, you're anticipating, what, one full stop and one splash and go. So you'll take over the driving chores and drive more than half the race. Right, and it depends on how the yellows fall. The BMW can definitely go the, with one stop, but if we're lucky with the yellows, we'll get by with one stop as well. That's what we're counting on. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble. We anticipate the green this time by as they come through turn 12. There, no. We did not green. No, I think <laughs> the lights we went not. off in the pace car. The pace car pulled off, but they're not ready for a start. Nice that looks like the interstate down to L.A. Nice <laughs> Back at Sears Point, you can see the cars on the track now getting lined up for the three-hour IMSA Endurance Championship event. Kelly Collins and Jason Priestley out of Hollywood. We talked to both. They start in the front row. There's Joe Vardy. He leads the point standing starting inside the second row. And Morel Cochran in number three outside in the uh, Firebird Formula. Then it's Stu Hayner and Mitch Wright in the third row. And in row four, on the inside, there's John Coleman in 47. Craig Conway will go outside in car number two. Once again, as we take a look at the rest of the field, we can tell you that the top 18 qualifiers were all in the Grand Sport Division. The fastest qualifier in the sport class was Chris Wilson. He'll be starting uh, 19th in car number 30. The fastest in touring was John Green, starting car 38 in the 29th position. And the fastest in the compact class, Dave Doherty, in uh, car 76, he'll be starting 33rd. So this is the Endurance Championship Series. However, this is only a three-hour event. And this is like a sprint race compared to the last outing, which was 24 hours. Well, to help us uh, explain whether they think it's an endurance event or not, we've got uh, one of the drivers here, cars positioned fourth on the grid. David Murray, you're up here for about half an hour. Uh, do you think it's going to be an endurance race? These races are, three-hour races are considered a sprint race for these guys. You have to go really, really hard to, to make up for it. Now, here they're going to have a lot of yellows. I, we anticipate a lot of yellows because of the type of track it is. There's not going to be very many places to pass. When you get through the Zestas, you really have to follow a slow car. But, you know, you get impatient when you're, you're falling behind. So there's a lot of folks that are getting a little aggressive and try to pass where maybe they shouldn't. And I think there's going to be some, some off-road excursions here. <laughs> I see there's going to be a lot of off-road excursions. Just look at that traffic coming through that last uh, uh, right-hand sweeper. Well, David knows something about winning and won eight times in endurance competition. In fact, the 94 Grand Sport champion. So this is really, for you, a two-pit stop race. The first is a full stop, if you will. You'll change drivers. You'll take over. The second stop, you anticipate a splash and go. Right. But the BMW can go on one stop regardless. So our strategy is to hope, you know, we don't like to see all the yellows and so forth. But in our case, we want to see a lot of yellow because we get better fuel mileage, which means we can turn this into a one-stop event for us. We could never go an hour and a half on a tank of gas under the green, but if we have enough yellow, you can go two laps on the yellow for the same fuel or one lap on the green. So you think that's the only way right now if that's the BMW to hold together all the shots to win this race? Uh, I think so. I mean, that's going to be the tough part of it all. We're, we're all, I know all the other folks are in that same boat. You know, the only person, people that can do it on one stop is the BMW. And the BMW being so fast, it's going to be a tough, uh, tough call to catch up because he's, he's on the pole. You've got 59 cars packed into the two and a half miles. You come up there, three flags. 
the inside going by the 75 for second position so he dropped back to about six and now in a lap he's back up to second challenging for the lead we saw there what david murray meant of course the bmw there as it came down to that turn 10 there that the tight 183 hairpin he outbraked everybody This isn't off-road racing. Tough racing, I'm you. are going to talk to him on that pit stop. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is not an... This, uh, that's not how you this drive not a three hour race. Either. Very, very tough. Very hard. You'll probably be happy to get a good run off the turn six. Passing warning to the shortest lap. Yeah, that's all over the now. Once you get the lead, you're going to be patient. If you just be patient and pick a good spot, he'd have an easier go of it. Not so sure. Well, there's a lot of drivers like that. They've got to win the first quarter of the first race. But this long left hand is coming up, what I call the carousel. He can get a good shot up here. There's a bit of a short straight, then up to the turn seven. And he might be able to use that BMW race if he's going to get by your car. Right, I think so. Now you'll see there's a punt, uh, Pontiac pull away a little bit. But you'll see, uh, oh, he's on the inside now. So now they'll be on the outside going this turn. Bernie's going to try to make a tough one, but I don't think he can break his weight. position the BMW up in front where it started after falling back to about fifth or sixth position actually in second position now there's a look at third party and the smoke is uh, yeah, 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 
That's what's good about having the, the, the Pontiac and the Mustang is having the torque. So Kelly Collins in the BMW continues to lead in the BMW M3. And we've got a turbo RX-7 riding in second. We're coming to you from Sears Point Raceway in Sonoma, California. Back with our action in the three-hour MC Endurance Championship from Sonoma, California. This is wine country, but we'll drink some wine after the race because right now we're watching the BMW M3 of Kelly Collins continuing to set the pace. And the, the guess was, David Murray and uh, David Hobbs, that uh, he was the odds-on favorite to win this thing because of uh, the handling, the braking of the car, and also the fuel economy. Right now, he's uh, showing some speed out front. He looks good, but you know, normally you start, you finish your stronger driver, and I think Kelly is probably the stronger driver on the team, and you would think that the track could be the other way around. But maybe he's shooting to get a good lead, and uh, maybe this track will come back to him. Well, what is his toe driver like? Now, there is the 69 car in the pit. We had uh, a report that he was dropping oil on the racetrack, and some drivers directly behind were calling back to the pit and saying, hey, tell IMSA that 69 is dropping oil. So David Mead in the pit lane. The hood was up there momentarily. The crew walks away. Does that mean the end of the day? Well, down at the end of the car. That, that's interesting because many, many years ago, a driver really could not tell his crew someone's dropping oil up in front. But now with the advent of the radios, there's great communication. Radios are great. You know, I'm sure the thanks you body, it works out good for everyone because the thanks you body can come over and tell your crew what you're being black for. So there's no surprise when you come in. You already know what you need to do. Are you somewhat surprised that Jason Priestley has maintained that position up there as well? We thought he might fall back because his teammate actually qualified that car for outside the front row, and he simply does not have the experience that many of the drivers do, as we, we applaud his efforts and his determination, but uh, he's still being pretty impressive right now. He's very impressive right now because he's staying in front of a lot of the guys. Mitch Wright back there uh, behind him. He's holding off a lot of, a lot of good drivers, and that Mustang, going to tend to fall away a little bit more than some of the other cars would. But yeah, we're looking at second on back right now. man going past Joe Zardy. I sure is. Spot. Bernie Great. Cochran up to uh, third now. This is the best I've seen Bernie drive in all the time we've been together. And I know he was really motivated about this race. And he really wants to win it back. So if we can stay in the hunt, uh, maybe we'll have a shot at it. Well, the Joe Zardy car there, the, the RX-7, suddenly seems to drop one of the pace that's been passed by everybody. So that puts your man, Bernie Cochran, up into second spot. We've talked about the fuel economy for that BMW M3, but Greg Kramer, how about some uh, strategy and fuel economy for the other makes? Well, guys, it pretty much follows what Mr. Murray up there in the booth was saying. Both the Mazda and the Mustangs need some yellows if they're going to make it on one stop, particularly the Mazda, who's a little bit worse shape. They're thinking maybe an hour 10 minutes, hour 15 on the outside before they need a little help. The Mustangs, on the other hand, are looking more like an hour 20, hour 25. They still need a yellow. Now, the thing with the Mazda, the reason that it might be dropping back a little bit, is they can adjust that a little bit in terms of the boost, in terms of how hard they're on the throttle. If they don't go to full rev, it doesn't boost as high, they can improve their fuel economy. That's why we might see Marty just dropping back a little bit, and that's maybe just working on fuel. We have David Murray in the booth with us, the co-driver of that uh, number three car that's being hawked right now by Jason Priestman. I want to know what you're going to say to your teammate if he gets passed by a Hollywood type. <laughs> I want to tell him to go to Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, Priestley in that white 46, having a good ride night. Now his teammate qualified the car, and as we said earlier, we anticipated that he would fall back, but that has not been the case. He fell back a couple of positions and now has developed his rhythm. And uh, he's doing quite well. I tell you, I'm really surprised and impressed with the guys that run up there. Here you see the, the factory uh, Pontiac wheel-to-wheel -wheel guys back there, the number two and number one car. And there's a lot of folks in front of them that wouldn't normally be in front of them. Jason Priestley, Bernie. These guys are really running hard. It shows you how competitive this field's getting now, too. And to you know, have those guys running with the guys that are out there is pretty impressive. But let's talk strategy for just a moment. Both you guys as drivers, at this juncture of the race, you want to set a pace. It's a long race. 
when you settle into a rhythm back in third or fourth and think, hey, let somebody else lead, I'm comfortable with this pace. Hey, there's Body in the pitch. This is uh, unexpected, not a routine pit stop. We saw the smoke earlier. We thought and we heard that it was the same thing that had happened at Watkins Glen. Obviously, this is not the same thing. There's something wrong with that car. Yeah, it doesn't look very good right now. I know Joe doesn't want to be in the pitch right this minute. Marty, of course, is leading the point standing by only eight markers over John Heinrichsy, and this could well take him out of the uh, point chase. John Heinrichsy is going to slide second in the race. Uh, I think he's taking the wheel off. They want to look inside. Let's go to the pit, Greg. Well, gentlemen, it appears to be electrical. You can see they just put a little short into uh, some of the electrical wiring on the harness. Apparently, it's electrical problems. Whatever it was, we're going to send it back out. We'll try and talk to Sylvain in a minute to find out exactly what the problem was. Now, has the race gone on long enough? They top off the fuel, I assume. We did not see them, but uh, any crew is going to top off the fuel anytime that car is in the pit lane. Have they gone long enough that this can change their pit window? It's possible. I don't. It will help them. If they have a yellow now and have a number of yellows, which I expect to see a lot more than there are, there's not any yet. Uh, that will be his splash now if he can do one more full stop if there are enough yellows. I don't think he can go on one stop now, but he could if they had yellow. And he hasn't lost a lap, so if the yellow comes out, he'll catch back up and we'll block him. Well, this is the fourth race for Sylvain Ridley, and uh, the last three outings, he was the fast qualifier. Couldn't quite get the job done this time, but he watches his uh, teammate, Joe Vardy. Let's go down pit side and visit with Ridley. Move to the front. Then it started to move back suddenly into the pit, so then what happened? We're, we're chasing some gremlins in the engine computer system, either a loose plug or something. Uh, it's been a tough weekend for us. Hopefully, hopefully that fixed it. We just reset everything, shut the car off, and set it back down. We'll see what happens. I'm just, I'm hoping that we fix it. What effect did it have on the car itself on the pit? It just, Joe said that it was doing real down on power and it was putting out. So it was, just, it was really hard to go out. He's doing a great job trying to bring it back up there. So it's so I mean, you know, now we're we're behind, we're 40 seconds behind the leaders, and we gotta try everything in the book, you know. Well, keep in mind, if the driver now is Vardy, when he gets out, the guy who had those three pole positions gets in. No lack of speed on this team. I want to talk again about strategy. I started to ask the question of, of you two gentlemen here in the, in the broadcast booth with me before that that stop by Vardy. Obviously, you're you're not getting lap prize money to lead this thing. The prize money is at the end. We know we have to make one, two stops. We're anticipating yellows. At this point, does the driver just set a good rhythm, a good pace? Let's say you're back there in third or fourth position, and you simply say to yourself, I am content to ride right here. This is a nice pace for me in the car. I'm going to ride here, let the race get on down the road a bit before I try to compete. Now, I tell you, it, in longer races, 24-hour race, 12-hour race, you, you might have that strategy, but in a three-hour race, Absolutely not. These guys are driving as hard as they can. Now, that means you know, the BMW doesn't have to worry about brake problems, brake fades, or anything like that. They're driving as hard as they can without abusing the tires. The Pontiac and the Mustangs, all the other guys are driving as hard as they can. Brakes become a factor for those cars. They're trying to drive as hard as they can without getting the brake fade. And that's not saying that you're going to go in there and be easy on the brakes and think, well, I'll just take it easy. You're, you're driving them as hard as you can without losing them. You don't want to have a brake fade or wear the brake pad. You know, sometimes you push too hard, you'll spread the calipers and the pads will wear uh, on an angle, and then they wear out prematurely. So you're trying to go as absolutely hard as you can because you can't make that time in these, these types of cars, these types of racing. It's a sprint race. Still early in the race, though, and a big lead right now for that guy right there. That is Kelly Collins, who continues to show the way in his BMW M3 from Sonoma, California.
the IMSA Endurance Championship from uh, Sonoma, California. And right now, Kelly Collins enjoying something like a 19-second advantage over Stu Hayner in car 32. And there is a Bernie Cochran in third. Uh, Priestley has fallen back to seventh position. This is the battle for third right now. And that is Cochran in three. And Vic Rice in the white 14. That is the battle for third. And we have been uh, enjoying our conversation with the co-driver of that number three car, David Murray, who uh, says he has to leave us in the booth and, and head back to uh, the pit lane because you've got some driving to do. I sure do. It's getting more nervous up here than it is down there, but it's still tough. <laughs> Uh, lost the position. Bernie is, is really driving tough. He's driving clean, not doing anything wrong, but he is he's really driving the best I've seen drive all year. I'm really proud of it. Uh, car Chevrolet, Old Wheels, and Pontiac, if you will. Uh, he's doing a great job. We got the car set up well. It's working well. And Bernie's just being a good job of keeping up front. He's just way ahead of where he, he uh, should be, I think, and he's doing a great job. So you're trying well, to tell us I think, <laughs> well, I'm getting nervous right now because the strategy becomes important now. We're getting into the race to the point of if we stop now on the yellow, that would that could be our splash. But is that going to be enough for the end? You've got to watch what everybody else does, too, because if they pit, you don't, then you're out without any fuel. Are you telling us it's more nerve-wracking to watch this? Not, oh, yeah. <laughs> Much more. <laughs> we'll let you get down there because we're here in Convention. We may have a full course yellow. You have a car stop on the racetrack, so we appreciate your commentary. You know where the cameras are, so give us a wave when you get out there. I can do that. All right. Thank you, Thank you Murray. Me. Thanks for uh, joining us here in the uh, broadcast booth as we watch uh, Murray Cochran uh, now in fourth position in that uh, Pontiac. And there is Jason Priestley, who has dropped back now to 10th position. And uh, I'm, I'm Curious is what's going on. Uh, Greg Kramer, he started to uh, ran well for a while, and now he's dropped back to 10. He's been hit, I think, in the back of the car. Is, uh, down. Greg? Well, we're having some Thank audio. You. There you go. Go ahead, Greg. Yeah, I think uh, going into the camera. Apparently, they went in three wide, and it was Jason that ends up sort of hung out to dry on the outside. In the opening of the show, you gentlemen were talking about the marbles on the track. Guess what? Jason got into it. There was nothing he could do about a car that was a small, lazy fence, and he continued on. Now, their team car, number 47 Mustang, stopped in the pit in a flat tire from some contact on the track there back out. Well, I'm still impressed with, with Priestley. He's up to 10th position, uh, learned a valuable lesson with David Hobb. That's part of the learning curve right there. Well, absolutely. There's an awful lot of time. 59 cars down into this small two-and-a-half-mile track. There's no room for a breathing. It's a very quick track, so there's a lot of track. And there are those marbles. You see that on that shot. You can see all that stuff starting to build up on the outside of the corner. That's going to become a problem as this race goes on. These guys are going to start running a lot of power off these cars. You get rolled up on the other side of the track. Of course, as the faster cars come bowing through the slower cars, they're going to be wanting to lap them and they're going to be offline. They get in those marbles. Took us a couple of ladies on. There's the 25 car. The start is absolutely dead bottom last. Here's a look at the tail end, I think, of the Priestley altercation. I think we have that on tape, the very end of it. And there you can see him headed the wrong direction. And right there, he gets tagged just a bit Whoa. by the 47 car of John Kohler. And Kohler hits the tires, knocks all the tires out of position. And Priestley is right in the middle of the racetrack, but he was able to continue on, as you saw, back there now in the... Uh, where is Priestley now in the uh, 46 car? Back in ninth position. Ninth position. Here's that 25 car, which, as I say, started dead last, but he's making a tremendous run through the field. They were the fastest qualifier. They were disqualified from uh, after qualifying. They found something wrong with the airbox and put them back in the track at the back. That's the uh, Peter Cunningham, Joe Danaher car. And uh, as you say, a long way to go from the back of the pack. 59 cars starting this event. And in fact, earlier this season, we've seen as many as 75 cars start this race. There's the 42 car, that very unusual pit lane entrance. Paul Dubinsky and uh, Will Montemaker. Montemaker and uh, Paul Dubinsky. And of course, the speed limit on pit lane is 65 miles an hour, but uh, David Hobbs, there's not really a threat, I think, of breaking that because you have to go through that uh, entrance so slow in that big, scooping right-hander. You really can't pull much speed down the straightaway. No, you down that, uh, pit lane. off so slow anyway. It's safety to the Again, this is a three-hour event, and as you heard David Murray say, you don't treat this like a long race, like a 12-hour or a 24-hour race. It is indeed a sprint race. You go out 
there, you get a quick pace for yourself and try to get to the front and stay there. Yes, it is, it is an endurance race, but it's, uh, it's something tougher. And a uh, sprint race just short enough. But as he said, these guys really drive out and flat out for the whole time. Uh, but it's going to be slightly modified cars and a lot of things components that really don't do very well out there. They've got to be easy on their tires, they've got to be easy on their brakes. There you see the truck coming to take the ball those tires. There's the not, yellow they were out. looking for, David Hobbs. The pace car is out, the amber lights on, and that is the reason why. Uh, that was the uh, altercation involving Jason Priestley, and you saw him get into, or actually the number 47 car of John Kohler get into Priestley, and then the tire barricade, the tires went everywhere. And so we had the localized yellow for a few laps, and they went to a full course yellow to get all those tires out of the way. So uh, this is the first yellow that we've seen. Uh, but obviously a lot of teams, David, are looking for a number of yellows to slow the field and conserve the fuel. So once again, that BMW M3 is out in front. Car number 62, the purple entry of uh, Kelly Collins. He started with the pole as a fast qualifier. He continues to lead this thing as Stu Hayner rides in second. And there is the Rice car number 16 up to third. The Murray Cochran entry uh, up to fourth. You take a look at the top eight as we'll come back with more from Sears Point. What you guys qualify for tomorrow? What? No, Ross Bentley. Hello, hello. Count to ten. There you go. One, two, three, four, five, six, ten. Tricked you. <laughs> well, how much? Like you know about these cars? Uh, how long do you want me to stay? Till the entire race is over. I can't stay that long. <laughs> Fifteen and twenty minutes. Sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Fine. You have not missed a thing as we come back to Sears Point. We have been under a full course yellow to clean up some uh, errant tires that uh, were scattered. John Kohler uh, clipped Jason Priestley and clipped the tires, and they went rolling. But uh, we're about to uh, go back to racing. Yeah. 
Kevin, uh, that last right hand sweep that we I'll let them drive up and drive up. I think it's a lot easier. racetracks to pass anybody on so with the different classes in, in this race uh, the guys in the quicker cars have really got some tough work ahead of them. Well we were saying earlier that the first thing is there's so many on that one they let so much rubber down it's obviously being rolled up and flipped to the side. So when the fast cars come to lap some of the slower guys they're going to be off to lap way off line and then by the end of this race it's going to be knee knee to the gravel that's rolled up rubber and then it's going to get really yeah, I mean, you know, the, the marbles up there, particularly the new carousel down to turn six. I got off there yesterday, and I, I thought it was nice. It was unbelievable the way it was there. So, it's, I mean, that's the thing. They're trying to get so good with a couple of spots to the Yeah, you see this, Bob, it's starting to roll up there on that very fast uh, right now. You have a new teammate. Exactly. Jay Cochran on board now. Uh, got along, snap on along to the team and everything. I'm really excited. We've had... Like three or four different, I've had three or four different teammates this season, and now with Jay on board for the rest of the year, it's extremely great, a lot of experience, uh, we're going to make a, a great team for the rest of the year. Yeah, he's had some great times there in the U.S. Yeah, I mean, our team is just relatively new, we're, you know, we're, we're sort of building everything, we've got a couple of areas that we've got to address car wise the team. Oh, a car spinning. That's the 71 car. Is that Teflin the car? I think it's Richard Teflin in the car, unless they've had it. Turn the lights on everybody else. Oh, great. Yeah, Teflin. That one uh, is uh, in that car. If you take a look right there at 51 and 52, they are riding now in the, uh, well, let's check the position. They're riding back in 16th and 17th, which would be tops uh, for their class. And let's go down uh, pit side, and uh, Greg Kramer has the crew chief for Jim Pace and for Barry Waddell. Yeah, uh, gentlemen, Jeff Lutz is his name, and he's the crew chief for both of those BMWs. The obvious question is, Jeff, you've got a BMW leading overall in the Grand Sports Division. The reason everybody believes braking, handling, and the best track is that the main story is what's going to happen with the cars that you said are known for their braking and their handling. And uh, Sears Point is a definitely a braking and handling track, not really the big horsepower track like uh, some of the others. The other thing that we have going for is a lot of driver experience. As you know, that's really important here at Sears Point. Well, we got Barry Waddell, we got Jim Pace in the two stars right now, and the gentleman will be taking over from Jim is Kyle Cura. And Kyle, the obvious thing is you've got a talented driver in the car now, but it's a long race. What does he have to do to get into the car that gets the race? Well, I hope that talent is carrying over to preserving the car for the second half of the race. We've got to conserve tires, we've got to conserve brakes, and uh, just try and keep the car as cool as we can by not running too close to anybody else out there, maintain the temperature so we can take it to the finish. And, of course, we're seeing that kind of story developing a little bit further back in the pack. And right now, Cal is down a little bit further down the pit lane and the driver is making one heck of a charge from the back. Cal? 
That's right, Greg. We've got Bill Danaher here, and uh, his teammate, the team Cunningham. You guys had the highs and lows racing over the last 24 hours. Team put the car on the pole last night, and uh, unfortunately, you were uh, foul of the IMSA regulations a little bit. Tell us a bit about that. They put you to the back of the grid. But what it was was, was some, some the night, the day before in practice, we had had an incident which took some parts off the car, and then we were doing the pole repair. We didn't sort of patch it together for qualifying. Well, it was uh, out of wreck, and we did get DQ'd, and we had to start in the back of the pack. Uh, sometimes in endurance racing, that's not a real problem, but, but it does put you back with an awful crowd. Uh, so we just sort of uh, you know, put our foot in it and just reason through, thank goodness, without too many dents. Okay, well, Joe put the car up into the top six in class immediately, and they took advantage of that full course yellow. We've got Petey Cunningham, one of the high guns in this series. He's very fast. He should be looking close to a victory, but it's going to be tough work for him. I thought I'd go comb my hair with him in the car. <laughs> well, with, <laughs> before that pit stop, he ended up to 30th position after starting uh, in last position in 59, so a good ride so 30 far. 30 positions, making up 30 positions, not too bad, is it? Oh, <laughs> not <laughs> most, most, most races don't even have 30 cars in them, and you make up 30, and you're still only halfway through the field. Ross Bentley, how much does this track change from practice session to qualifying? We're seeing so much rubber being laid down. All the drivers talk about how slick this racetrack is. It's slick, but is it fairly consistent? No, I, unfortunately it's not. I was surprised at how slick the track was when we got here on Friday morning. Oh, Whoa! crash coming down to turn 10. Nasty crash. That's a fast place to crash. And all those tires have been spread out again, so somebody hit that wall, and they must have hit that wall pretty hard. The 99 car. That's a... fatal mistake of overcorrecting and it snapped back on him spun round rammed into the wall and that seemed to be that he did that all on his own would this be too early if we get a full course yellow would this still be too early to make the pit stop and make the driver change well it must be getting pretty close now they've been running for nearly an hour out of the three so i would think this would be an ideal opportunity to make the, the stop well, there you see your leader coming through that area with the uh, the damaged car and all the tires. So we'll wait to see if we actually get that full course yellow. And if we do, will the drivers and teams take advantage for a driver change? Northern California at uh, Sears Point for the IMSA Endurance Championship. We really have just gone back to green after a lengthy yellow because of a crash headed down towards turn 10. There is your leader, car 62, that is Kelly Collins in the BMW. He has led from uh, early on in this event as we started from the pole position. So this was the area where the crash happened a number of laps ago that prompted the full force yellow. And here's what, watch the red car back here. That is David Alloy. He loops it right here, catches the tire wall, watch the rear window, and it shatters as it hits the ground, and then he gets uh, collected by the 52 car, Barry Waddell. Barry was uh, in the hunt for class honor, and they're really about uh, 13th or 14th overall, but uh, did some body damage to that BMW, so that prompts the full force yellow to get the alloy car off the track, to get all the glass swept up, and to get those tires back where they belong. So now we're back to uh, green flag racing, once again, Kelly Collins continues to lead in car number 62. Now up in the second position is uh, Vic Wright. He is now second. And, uh, we want to take a quick break and come back with uh, all the class leaders. Let's get four classes running for three hours here at Sears Point. We'll take this commercial break and come back with all the class leaders.
And just one hour into this three-hour endurance race from the Sears Point Raceway here in Sonoma, California, in the wine country of Napa Valley, as we take a look at the class leaders. And uh, once again, Collins, Gary Collins continues to lead. He has led from early on from the pole position in the uh, overall, plus uh, leading, obviously, in Grand Sport. He's looking very, very strong. There's the sports leader, the 51 car of Jim Pace. The compatriot, the number 52 car, of course, got uh, badly damaged in that big shunt coming up the last turn. Pace came in, made a driver change. So uh, we talked earlier to uh, Kyle Turin. He is in the race car right now. But they're overall being shown in 25th position. But they are being shown in number one now in the sports division. Right in the middle of the big melee there as they come into turn 10 here. That'll run. to the outside and goes through turn 11 to complete one more lap. Once again, not a, uh, we don't count the laps here. It's a timed event, a three-hour endurance. We're also being joined here in the uh, broadcast booth by Ross Bentley. It will be in action tomorrow in the World Sports Cars in the uh, Park Tool. They'll start in sixth position. And uh, we'll have a chance to do the touring here. Once again, four different divisions running here. And there's the 85 car who is leading the touring class. Not made the pit stop and to run first in class. An awful lot of cars start to show signs of bodywork. The 44 car just uh, seemed to go either off the road uh, on purpose or just drove off the road up there. As we watch the 85 car come up with the turn seven, the type is going in here, the real type happened. He's 17th overall, but leading in class. But one thing to remember, four classes, but right now he is leading in his class and 17th overall. And I, this, I would think during this driving spin at this point, an hour of the race, the track is slick, it is hot, it's extra hot inside the cockpit. These guys have to get in tired. And Ross Bentley, when you get tired, the concentration goes away, you start to see the cars slide and make some little mistakes. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is uh, the dangerous part of the race. Really. You know, your concentration is, is suffering a little bit, but uh, uh, the track is definitely getting worse at this point. You know, we've had a couple of tracks for the time before the track. Shaping up between uh, number three and uh, well, we just saw a pass there. That's our pass commentator. That is David Murray, who we uh, had up in the booth here at the beginning of the show, driving the number three car. Uh, now shown in third, third spot. position. So does that mean that I automatically go into third spot? Third spot. Oh, that could be it. You know? No, only if you start the broadcast with us, then get in the race car. Does that work? No, I'm sorry, I'm busy at the start of the race tomorrow. <laughs> We'll just mic your helmet. How's that? You can commentate from in car. I don't know if you. I don't know if you're allowed to say that in the TV. Well, we'll, we'll put a delay <laughs> signal on for you. 
Well, David Murray actually is not in the car. They've not made that stop. So uh, Cochran continues to run up there in the third spot in number three. But Murray will then take over on that first pit stop. And as you heard him say earlier, he had uh, planned to make the stop, take over the car, and then have a splash and go. So, uh, Ross, want to thank you for uh, taking the time to come over here and spend some time with us. We wish you well. We are eager to watch you and your exploits tomorrow in the Snap One Tools car. So, thanks for coming by. Great. Thanks for having me here. Well, we'll take this break, come back with more action from the IMSA Endurance Championship. over an hour and 16 minutes into the race and looky here your leader is in the pits. Kelly Collins uh, started from the pole dropped back initially but then uh, regained the top spot and has led throughout much of this event so uh, is this an early stop we're under a full course yellow but we'll take a look at what happened this is Michael Himes in a Miata backs into the tire barrier rolls it all the way over now he breaks all the glass, he actually looks out, readjusts his left side driver mirror, and will then drive away. Well obviously he'd have to adjust the mirror because he would obviously want to know who was coming up behind him. Well he's <laughs> the only person behind him would be a safety worker. Let's go track side, Craig Freeman. We have a slew of pit stops going on. The number three car, the, uh, the Pontiac, is in. Burnell Cochran Jr. is getting out. David Murray, who we were talking with earlier, is in the car. Just a couple of stalls back. We also see the number 32 machine. That's Stu Hayner in the Pontiac. He is out. Getting in that car is Heinersy. Our overall leader, number 62, just made a stop. And he is back out on track. So things happening in a hurry here. As a result of that yellow, we're almost exactly at the hour and a half mark. This may have played right into the hands of some of these people, assuming there's some more yellows a little later on to stretch that field economy. Actually, we had that full course yellow, but uh, David Hobbs, I think this was the reason for the full course yellow and not the rollover. That's uh, Bud Schramm in the number eight uh, Mazda Miata. He stalled down there in turn 10. That brought out the full course yellow. He spun and stalled and just couldn't get it started because he was parked right on the outside. Here, here we see him coming in here. And you see some tire smoke right there as he loops it right in front of uh, our camera position, right in front of a corner worker. And the yellow uh, comes out for that particular area of the racetrack, but then they realize that he was parked right there and was not going to move. Actually, it's number six. I'm sorry, number six, Fred Nelson, and not number eight. Number six is Fred Nelson. So he was stalled there. That brought out the full course yellow. But actually, the uh, rollover by Michael Himes did not bring out the yellow, and he drove it back to the pit lane. Let's go back to uh, the pit area and Calvin Fitch. Okay, I'm standing by with Jim Pace, one of the most versatile drivers in the competition. Jim, we've seen you working World Sports Car with Wayne Taylor, winning three races, Daytona, Sebring, and Texas. And here we see you leading another class, the sports class, with the BMW number 51 before you hand it over to your teammate. How do you manage to run so fast and everything you get in? Well, I, I think it's a lot, of, a lot of hard work, a lot of years with the Skip Barber Racing School and trying to practice what we preach there. But, uh, you know, we just got back from Le Mans with the World Sports Car team, a great car, great effort change the patch, put the Toyo tire on, and get out in the Davis Racing BMWs, and uh, we're leading the class. Just did a driver change, sort of dropped back a little bit to third, but it's a good car. Hopefully, we'll, uh, we'll come out on top in this race, too. Tell us a little bit about that experience at Le Mans. It's everyone's dream to go over there, and you certainly achieved that this year. A little disappointing that you guys weren't able to pick up the triple crown, but it must have been a tremendous experience anyway. Well, it was. It was a fantastic experience, and the, the whole dank of, you know, motorsports group there with the Oldsmobile and the Caprelli tires. And Riley's got everybody on that team really put forth the effort, but to run there at Le Mans, you really need a special Le Mans car. I mean, you need special body work, you need special fuel mileage, you name it, it needs to be special for Le Mans. To go there with a the top team and having one Daytona and one Sebring was really special. I'll always remember it. Hopefully, we'll be back next year. Okay, I'm sure when they go back next time, they'll be even stronger. Back to the booth. Well, you're looking there at the number 16 Mustang in the pit lane. That would be the car of 
Vic Rice. He had assumed the lead when the 62 car pitted. Now he makes uh, his first of what would be probably two stops for that Mustang, and that would uh, give the lead to car number 26. So now uh, in the lead would be the uh, 26 car, and that would be Peter Sachs. So we'll uh, take a break as we remain under yellow. We'll sort everything out and uh, come back to racing with uh, now about an hour and 20 minutes into the three-hour race here at Sonoma. Well, after a, a lengthy yellow and the bright sunshine here in Northern California, we've had uh, numerous pit stops and driver changes, which uh, have scrambled the standings somewhat. So we'll take a look at the top uh, 10 or 12 for you. The Hacker Express now qualified to 15th and 25th respectively, but now they're up to second and uh, third. And there's the Martini Collins entry, the BMW. 10th position is Cochran Murray. We had uh, David Murray on with us earlier on the uh, telecast. Ancolani back there in the 12th position in car 37. So right now with uh, some driver changes, let's go back trackside with Calvin Fish. Okay, I'm here with one of the wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing drivers, Mitch Wright. Mitch, you came in early. Andy got in the car, Andy Pilgrim, that is, and uh, he pitted under that yellow. Can you go the rest of the way? What is your fuel stop strategy right now? Well, right now, we, uh, Andy just came in under this last yellow. And uh, we definitely don't plan on stopping again. We're going to worry and gamble, roll the dice, and we're going for it at this point. This, this, the length of this yellow really helped us out quite a bit. Okay, well, this puts you in the window where you should be able to make it to the checkered flag. And as I understand it, the last time you two guys teamed up together here, you actually took up to the overall victory. That's right. Uh, Andy's always been my good luck charm. So we were, we're looking for a victory. We're, we're definitely came here to win. And it's great for me because it was a kind of a one-off deal. They just called me up middle of last week and said, hey, can you come out and race with us? And... You know, these wheel-to-wheel -wheel guys, we struggled with the car a little bit early in the week, and they just put their nose down to the grindstone and just make it happen, you know. They really, uh, really got their act together. This team always looks as though they've got a chance of victory, and uh, they certainly have it to here. But uh, Greg Kramer's further down pit lane with one of the other Pontiac teams. Thanks very much, Cal. Indeed, I'm with Sue Hayner, who got out of the number 32 Pontiac. And Sue, uh, we were just talking with Calvin about some of the activity going on with the number one and two cars of Gold Pilgrim. It looked like they started on a different fuel strategy, but they stopped at the same stop where you did, got out of the car, and put John in. Does that mean you guys are basically starting from square one for an hour and a half race? Basically, that's just come down an hour and a half sprint race, yeah. We went into it, obviously, uh, maybe obviously, I don't know, but we went into it to, to try to get about an hour 40 on a fuel load. And uh, at an hour 25, we hadn't had a stumble or anything else, so we were right on track. Of course, the yellow helped out a lot in that. But we were, didn't want to take a chance that we would get you know, have to fuel under green. So we decided it was close enough that we could get enough fuel in there to probably go to the end of the race. And uh, as long as John conserves a little bit, I think we can do it. So I don't know what everybody else can do, but we, I think we can. All right, thanks very much. I understand we have the gentleman who was our overall leader, the number 62 BMW down in the pit, Gary. Yeah, this is uh, obviously uh, an unexpected pit stop. We just see the green flag, a car gets putted off. Whoa, the whoa. And he gets hit by the number one car of Andy Pilgrim. We had just talked about Andy Pilgrim. Being the good luck job of the team. Yeah. And nails that 63 car on the start. The 63 car spun at turn one for the very first time at a restart. Not quite sure how he managed to do that there unless he got tagged. Poor old Andy Pilgrim coming up from the back, got blindsided and ran straight into the 63 car. So that Pilgrim's chance of, uh, of a win, I'd say, severely depleted. Andy has won. In fact, he's unbeaten in endurance championship races here at Sears Point. He's won three in a row. Now, let's watch it again. Oh, got, got tagged by your Hacker Express, the zero car. Tagged the 63. The 63 is leading. The zero car is lying second. There's a fourth place car of Andy Pilgrim, and he nails him from behind, so your leader involved in Tangle with fourth place. Actually got Tangle up to second place to begin with. And he continues on. Andy, you can see the damage, only minimal damage to the left front corner of that car, and he continues on. Here's a kid that grew up in England, won the 68 motorcycle race in England before moving to the U.S. in 1980. And in fact, he never raced a car in England until last May, went back and drove in Silverstone, and uh, placed third in the British Empire Touring Race in a Fortune 9-11. So in all those years, he won 68 times on bikes never have raced in England until last and day. very first race in England, he got on the podium. There's the 63 car, which of course was leading at the start of this race, at the start of the yellow, at the end of that caution period. The 63 car was leading, but he is absolutely done for the day. No question about that. That was Carlos 
Look at this, another uh, tangle, and there was David Murray in the three car, almost. Oh, a car, uh, I thought he was going to go on around. The double zero car for the Hacker Express. Uh, I'm not sure who's in that car right now. John Rulin started that, and uh, I'm not even sure he actually made the chip stop during that long yell. There is the 70 car, Joe Vardy and uh, Sylvain Tremblay. They're a number of laps down now, back in like 48th position. And they're well off the table after their Saturday afternoon drive right now. Another problem, car number 35. Jerry McDonald. Marty Miller. Wow, sharing that one. That's not a good place to be. Get out of the way. Off turn two. And uh, boy, action everywhere. The great start. The job was set up the track then. Well, a zero car is now leading. We're going to have a full course yellow. There, there's the red 95 car. They got upside down earlier, rolled all the way over. He's back out there running. So the uh, the car of Bart Hayes, Paul Hacker, and John Ruin now leading. The number zero car is your overall leader. And we've gone uh, an hour and four, almost 45 minutes into a three-hour event here at Steve Toy. Well, there's a look right now at the driver that has been said to be the leader, Bob Towery in car 71, but there seems to be a huge question mark on exactly what is going on as we remain under yellow. Greg Kramer, can you shed some light on what this controversy is all about? Well, I'm not sure that I can, but I think Joe Martin can. He was dancing around like a cage cat. He was trying to figure out some strategy. So, first of all, what happened? We brought the car in, it was damaged. We're working on it with a tow bar. What precipitated that? Well, Right after the restock, one car uh, ran into the leader, which was the 63 car. The yellow came out, and the, and the cars behind us passed us under yellow and actually hit us. So they let the whole field by, which, which gave us the lead again. They led us to the front. So basically, though, once they decided they made the mistake and had the answer to the yellow situation, they declared you the lead, had to wait the field by Right, we were about 10 minutes away from making it on fuel. That allowed us to come in, top it off. So it started as bad, became good. Sort of a, a chicken, soup to chicken. Well, it, it was like from chicken salad to chicken doo doo, but we turned it around. Now, if you started the first car. That's the only car you can get points to, and that car's way back. That kind of hurts you points-wise, doesn't it? Now, I'm kind of done on the points, but uh, as long as your team gets a win out of this, I'll be happy. And, of course, uh, keep in mind, folks, Sylvain Tremblay, who was supposed to get in after Joe, is now in 71, and that car is going very quickly indeed. So Sylvain has an opportunity to build on some points here as well. Gary? All right. We thank you for uh, sorting that out. So we'll see if uh, Vardy's teammate might pick up the victory here. Of course, early on today, the 62 car appeared to be the car to beat. That was the BMW. Kelly uh, Cowan started the race uh, from the pole position. And there's a look at uh, car number 62. And as we take a look now at the uh, rundown uh, as to where that car is running. Well off the pace. But, uh, let's go see what we can find. Oh, I guess he is well off the pace. He looks like he's going to stop down there now. Let's go back to the pit lane in Calvin City. Well, the man who seemed to be able to pull away from the field at will there was uh, Kelly Collins here. And uh, now you have to do a driver change. And it looked like you had great track position at the head of the field. Then, unfortunately, under the yellow, your teammate Martini actually had a punch and he had to come in and fix that. What's your strategy from here? Are you going to get back in the car? Well, uh, truly, first off, the unfortunate thing was is that we didn't recognize the flat tire soon enough. We thought it was marbles on the tire, and then we said clean the tires were not too late. Um, whether I get back in the car, uh, it depends on if we're going to have another yellow. If we have another yellow within the next, from here to the last 10 minutes of the race, I definitely will get back in the, uh, in the, in the race car. But uh, for right now, we're going to leave Martini in. He's giving him the door on the race car. And uh, we're going to get him back in the car. Okay, well, Kelly Collins does get back in the car. It's going to be some fun to watch him further down pit lane. Oh, excuse me, back up in the booth again. Well, right now, his uh, teammate being thrown in 28th position. And there is a look at interesting strategy that uh, he might climb back in the car as late 
has maybe 10 or 15 minutes to go in the race. So we'll see how that unfolds. We come back with more from Sears Point. And we're now inside the final hour of this three-hour endurance race for the IMSA Endurance Championship cars here at Sears Point in Sonoma, California. As you take a look at the, the top runners, and once again, the 71 car being shown in the lead. Look at Priestley Maxwell up to fifth position now. The Van Cleef Henderson entry in uh, the seventh position and cutting him all the way up to eighth after starting at the back of the pack. And there is the green Earwood uh, entry from Touring in the number 38 in ninth position. A <laughs> great vantage point. And there are indeed some great vantage points around the uh, rolling terrain here at uh, Sonoma, California at Sears Point. Let's go down trackside and Greg Kramer. getting old when you see a good looking gal and you have to ask her how old her mother is. Yeah. I was, I was talking to a gal. Talking to a gal. She was going to go out, but her grandmother got real sick and she's been going to the hospital because her grandma's at the point of death, which, which she is. And I said, how old is your grandmother? And she said, 68. I'm like, oh. <laughs> yeah. I didn't dare ask her how young she was then. I think they are. So you figure if her mom were 20 years younger than her grandma, that's 48, she's like 20. No, she's older. Than that. What do you find is the young thing? She is a uh, marketing director for a private club at the uh, venture there in April. Met her and she came to Speedway one day and we visited. And <laughs> He wants to go cruising this week despite her grandmother's illness because I'm thinking of a Brickyard 400 pace car. She wants to go cruising this track now. But she has her own convertible, so I don't know what to do about it. You don't pick enough of it, right? I got a feel like it's going to be a good thing to do. And after a prolonged yellow, we're about to go back to racing with that much time remaining. Just over 42 and a half minutes. We take a look at the class leaders, and there is your Grand Sport, Van Cleef and Henderson in sport. And there's the Cunningham car, number 25, leading in touring. And then Norris and the Mitchell Compact leading in that division. Quickly before the restart, let's go back to the pit lane with this update from Greg Creamer. Well, Gary, thanks. You just want to solve the fuel situation. When this yellow started, and you're right, it's been a long one. They were some of the teams up front in the grand sports that were concerned. Could they make it? That's out the window now. Everybody is golden all the way to the finish of this one. And to tell you how intense this battle is going to be, Joe Apollani, who owns the team that uh, John Hendricks is driving the number 32 Pontiac, said, we've told John, burn it down. Go to the finish. Look at the marbles outside that corner. Boy, the groove is very, very narrow. And uh, right on the marbles, they get right in the fence. Incredibly uh, narrow. And, of course, with some of these guys, like the 62 car that's going to be coming from the 40th odd spot, trying to get through, he's going to be wanting to overtake in some weird spots. That might be one of them. And I'll tell you what, when he gets up on those marbles, it's going to be mighty slippery. Sylvain Tremblay now at the keyboard of car number 71. That is the team car that he qualified yesterday. They had all kinds of mechanical problems, electrical problems, and stuff well back. So uh, Sylvain took over the reins of car 71. He is leading. Heinrich there in second. Buckhead really in the kill gap. David Murray in the third position. Number three is Oh, 
Although Trebley is driving the car to qualify every car. IndyCar series right now, our grads of this series, Wayne Taylor, of course, uh, he is the co-leader in the uh, World Sports Car Division, Irv Hare, Rob and Charlie Morgan, the one, two, three punch of IMSA GTS1, Larry Shoemaker, all the top five drivers in GTS2, all our grads in this division, Tommy Kenny, of course, is a great player in the SEC Grand Am. Pretty impressive that some of those guys, the second guy, the one who put them on the wall, Davey Jones, Ron Crook, have also competed in the Endurance Championship. Craig Conway and uh, Doug Good, I think. Doug Good is driving now. Good is all over the rear of Murray. That's the battle for third. Murray there in that, uh, kind of that dark maroon number three, almost a purple color. 46, there is Maxwell. That is the 46 car that Jason Priestley started the race in. That car now is in fifth position. Priestley gave it a good ride before turning it over to his teammate, Scott Maxwell. Maxwell qualified the car for the outside front row starting position. And uh, Priestley uh, did himself well with that. Sport. He did a lot of people who slipped back to the field, very competitive front end of the field. But he did. He hung on very, very well and he handed the car over in a very competitive position. To Maxwell. Andy Pilgrim uh, won in the number three car last year. And look at this move by Goad. Look at second, third, and fourth right together. Goad on the high side. Not exactly where you tell somebody to pass on the outside of a corner. Not that one. And as they start off down to the S's, this is a very fast string of left, right, left, right, uh, left, and then a super fast right. Very, very quick corner. This is the one where we saw the 95 car roll over. Uh, the car's picking up speed here, right up around about the 125, 130 mile an hour mark as they sweep to this massive right hand here, with all those marbles on the right, on the left. You mentioned the 95 car, in fact, it is back in the race, it rolled over, drove back to the pit lane, and then continued on now, uh, Alan Pine, in the cockpit, he's uh, in 42nd position, so uh, these cars uh, can roll over and continue on in competition. Hey, as long as this battle continues, as we see it swap positions there, the two car goes to third position. As long as they're battling, this gives Tremblay a chance to get it away. Yep, Goat stacks third spot away from our man David Murray there. So the number two car has now picked up the third spot. Right behind him is the Maxwell and the 16, 16 car, the 46 car that started off with Jason Priestley driving. This is going to be a tremendous race because we've only got about the tight right-hander downhill and uh, once again now about 40 about 39 minutes remaining in this event so we'll come back and give you more coverage from Sears Point. Back in Sonoma, California at Sears Point you have missed nothing and uh, there is a situation right there a good battle for second position. You've not missed it as it's side by side. Doug Goat on the high side and the red number two. A couple of Pontiacs squeezing him off the racetrack. That was Hydrasy that took, uh, took the competition right off the groove and right out to the Thule. Well, Doug Goat trying to go around the outside of that seven was a bit of a, an optimistic move, but he hung right in there and uh, he hung right in there until Hydrasy did push him off the road. So and Look at Hydrasy, though. He's closed in on Tremblay. Now about a car curling back. We thought Tremblay was pull away because those guys were uh, bumping and gouging behind him. But look at this. A couple of car lengths separating first and second. And look at the battle for second. 
Duck Joe Day got his right hand right away. He's giving his uh, little boost. Uh, little boost little nudge. I know you're back there. I took you off the track this last lap. And of course, fourth place is still Murray. Maxwell back in fifth. But look at this. The battle is up in front. RX-7 being challenged by a couple of Pontiacs. The race head off, got off to a bit of a late start. And of course, now you can see the shining in those driver's eyes as they go around that turn. Ooh, go, go, go down the inside. inside. He's going to make the pass. Great spot to overtake that four. It really is downhill. So now, can Doug Go do something about it? That's a bit of dicey between the two cars, dicey in the second and third. Let the Mazda pull away a little bit. Now Doug Go is setting off in hot. Well, Joe Car started outside the fourth row in eighth position. Greg Conway began the driving chores this afternoon. And let's take a look now in the upper left hand corner. Look for your favorite drivers. We give you a full field rundown as the competition continues. We have now uh, all about 35 minutes remaining in this three hour endurance championship. From the 2.5, two mile, 12 turn Sears Point Raceway. When we say 12 turns, you really count all the kinks and bends. You've got about 18 or 19 little turns out there. Absolutely, they don't count them. Woo! Big stir out going there for Waller. Scooter Gable. Well, I started the car, but I think uh, Borchell is in it now. Terry Borchell. And he got out in the, uh, the loose stuff but kept his foot in it. He's back there in the sixth position. There's the battle for fourth right there. David Murray is fourth and fifth is Maxwell. Very tight. Turn uh, two down the stretch. So it's a much steeper downhill than it looks there. Then they scoop uphill right into that sun. Cars get light to go to the top. Then a steep downhill for four. So we just saw that Doug go do that great pass. Uh, you know, right television can not be just as the elevation came out on the great track. This is all downhill here. Uh, then a little press there. Then more downhill. Do what I call the carousel turn six, long, long left-hander. A lot of uh, temperature going into those right tires there, the right hand rear. Long, long left-hander, then a bit of a straight here. And of course, this is a good opportunity to come off turn six. A really good opportunity to overtake somebody coming into this turn. Turn seven, where we saw Doug Joe try a couple of times on the outside behind the it didn't work. Doug Joe put something in the dirt right there. Uh, still only just in front of Heine, so you're not making much ground up on the master. Tremblay continues to lead in the car that he had not planned to drive. In fact, this is his 10th endurance challenge competition. And in nine previous races, he's been a quick qualifier on three occasions. In fact, all three races previous to the day, he was a fast qualifier. He's got a couple of wins so far this season. The most recent win was June 8th at Watkins Glen, the three hour in the uh, team car. certainly has not given up trying to get around Doug Goad in the red Pontiac as they struggle mightily for second position. Well, there is the uh, leader of the sports class, David Hobbs. Right over 66. Bob Henson, uh, uh, Eric Van Cleef. Yeah, Eric Van Cleef is in the car. Uh, Bob Henderson. In fact, Henderson became, the, I think, the oldest driver ever to win. Competition. He is now 10th overall. He's 62 years of age. In fact, he won Watkins Glen earlier this season. He was 62 years and 10 months. So he is almost 63 and going strong. Makes you a youngster. Absolutely. I'm glad he didn't stop me right here. 
Australia. There's somebody on the 3,000 property here. That's the only one. And he's out there racing, too. He's yeah. winning his lap. Yeah. Good old rap. That's right. We go back to the uh, front of the pack as we uh, near the final 30 minutes of this three-hour IMSA Endurance Challenge event from Deer Point Raceway here in Napa Valley. In the Mazda RX-7 Turbo, and he continues to lead. Go! Gets off the table just for a moment. We'll come back with more. Stay with us. Now we are back at Sears Point, and once again, you can see the gap there. Still very close between first and second. David Hobbs, Greg Kramer, Calvin Fish, and Gary Lee with all the action of the NCAA Endurance Championship. The car of Maxwell, the car that said he qualified yesterday, but uh, Jason Priestley actually started this race, and that 46 car now in the fifth position. That's the race for fourth, fifth, and sixth coming down to that turn four. Maxwell thinking about going down inside David Murray there, had second thoughts about it. Meanwhile, back to the leader as he swoops into turn six. A little press there, and then the road drops away. Long, long left-hander, almost 180 degrees. One long turn, uh, third gear. Hard on it as you the corner. Very important corner for the lap traffic in front. And of course, the 59 cars starting this event, lap traffic obviously plays a huge part in these uh, endurance races. Uh, one in fact, uh, that lap car right in front of our leader now, not making life easy for him. But uh, Tremblay swept through. Now the lap car is between Tremblay and Go. So that's going to hold Go up badly through these very fast efforts. Go, go, get it on the right out of the marble. That's what happens when you have to lap these guys offline. Go back to the pit lane, Greg. Well, that probably will help Joe Vardy if nobody else is confident in the world. I was so nervous to watch him knock his fingernails off. He is so nervous right now. I just looked at him and I said, Is Sylvain standing there? And he said, Car's great, Sylvain's happy. He said, Problem is, we've got 33, 32 minutes to go. He is nervous. I think a little bit of a traffic like that's going to help us. On the way back, then, I saw Terry Irwin, who, of course, started the number 38 Honda that's running second in the touring division and led there for so long. Stopped and said to Terry, I said, well, your strategy seemed to work. You're in front of the uh, number 25 car of Cunningham. And he said, yeah, but just by a little. And I said, did you mirror his fuel strategy? And he said, nope, the yellow was so long, they never had to come in. He said, we're both good to the finish. It's an absolute dog fight. And that battle on track is as good as his overall lead battle. You know, we could have seen more problems, David Hobb, with traffic had it not been for all these lengthy yellows and bunch the cars up behind the safety car. That's true, but uh, they are certainly going to get some serious uh, traffic coming up now. Uh, we still 25 odd minutes to go in this race. We're going to see a lot of lapping cars being uh, overtaken offline. And at the end, towards the end of the 3-hour race, we're going to see so much debris out there. Uh, the marbles, the rolled up rubber, the dust, a lot of dust blows around this racetrack. I mean, we're going to see uh, a lot of uh, super slidey drop you see down the end of the road right now. Well, this is just one of actually seven races here this weekend. And so in addition to the Jim Russell driving school utilizing this facility virtually every day of the week when they're not competing like this, we have so much rubber, so much grease, so much oil in this racetrack, it's like a skating rink out there. It's like a skating rink at the best of times, and it's, you can see it all lying off to the side of the picture there. I mean, it's deep. I mean, it's uh, <laughs> deep in rubber. And these guys are getting, woo, touching that back marker there. That's the, uh, that's that ball right there. These guys have to watch their mirrors to know when the leaders are coming up, not just uh, somebody competing for a position in that class. When those leaders come up, now you see he may have some uh, clear track. You see how slick it is down there coming off turn Tremblay getting really wide there coming off 10. Uh, Goad, of course, now right with him again. So less than 30 minutes to go, about uh, 28 minutes uh, to go. And we'll take you uh, to take a look at the touring leader, number 38. There's 
38 cars, and a white car right behind him is the 25 car of uh, Peter Cunningham, who he and his co-driver down there have come right from the back to take this position. So they're stuck in the field class, uh, haven't qualified fastest, and then got pushed to the back because they had a problem there. Here to see the 38 car coming in. Whoa! A little nudge there. Get out of my line. way, I'm coming up by you. It's the 93 car of Robert Baxter and Norman Davis. Now, at this time of the day, you've talked before about the glare, but just how bad is visibility at this time of the day? Very bad glare. Luckily here, you're not actually facing the sun for very long. Uh, here, for instance, right behind us, there's the old turn seven. It's kind of alongside you, shining. It's been pretty bright in that uh, driver's side window. And then coming back to these fast S's, it's, it's kind of the way behind you. So we've only got a couple of areas where it's bad. This being one of going around the turn there. We have a heck of a shootout because we still have about uh, 25 minutes to go. And uh, there's a look at the top four right there. Any one of those can win it or perhaps somebody else. We'll come back and figure it all out. As the minutes start to uh, flow away, now about 25 minutes, 24 minutes, remaining the three-hour feature here from the uh, Sears Point Raceway in Sonoma, California. Right now running out in front is uh, Sylvain Tremblay, Doug Goad, who's won uh, some 15 times in endurance competition. Now back there in second position. And of course, you have to credit uh, his drive and the great drive of his teammate, Craig Conway, who's standing by with Calvin Fitch. I'm here with Craig Conway and uh, standing by watching your teammate Doug go run around trying to put it in front and out in the lead. What are the emotions that you go through? Obviously you've done your part for the day and uh, now there's a few minutes left in this one and you're obviously hoping to make it to victory lane. I'm more nervous now than I was driving the car. Uh, he's doing a hell of a job out there. He's got his hands full with the 71 and 32. Um, uh, I'm hoping for the best. Obviously, uh, you know, with the 32 car behind you, you should be evenly matched. How does the Pontiac stack up against the Mazda around this racetrack? Normally, the Mazda has a little more straightaway speed than we do. Um, but it looks like right now he, he's heating his rear tires up, so we're hoping he maybe overdrives himself. We'll see what happens. Okay, well, it should be an interesting finish. And uh, further down pit lane, Greg Prima has a report. Thanks very much, Calvin. You can see a gentleman here who is very interested in what's going on. He just found out that he's third. Scott Maxwell just passing the number 32 body at the third. Jason, you started in the car and obviously had some problems in the early goal and gathered it up. Boy, what a great run, Jason. Yeah, thanks. We, uh, we've been having a good run. I had a couple of problems. I got back in the other half in there. Uh, I, was, I think I was running in before the fifth, and we had to get back in there. We a few cars got uh, gathered into it, but I was able to use the car going. Uh, not really have any problems. And back there, I lost a couple of plates, but I was able to make them up right away. Uh, 
you know, the Mustang's handling great out here, and uh, uh, we're real happy with the performance of the car, and the addition of Scott to my team has, has, really, has really helped all of us, and, uh, you know, I think we can see it in our performance here today. Well, obviously, uh, the car is flying up to third. You've got to be very thrilled with that. And also another uh, Mustang that's having a great run is just down a couple of pit stalls, the number uh, 54 entry uh, of uh, Dominic Manchuri and his team, Terry Borchler, another addition to the team. They're up to fifth, and they started 15th, so a couple of phenomenal drives by the Ford camp in the late going in this game. Great drive. So, David Hobbs, we're hearing that perhaps there is some tire wear on the uh, Tremblay car that could uh, change the outcome of this event? Well, I think they're hoping there's going to be some tire wear. I mean, he looks like he's leaning on the car pretty hard to us as he goes through that turn 11. He's looking on there. Look at it. Doug go, goes through. Oh, oh they get together. Wow. Look out. Boy, oh boy, this is a brave boy, this Doug Go. That's a very fast corner there. Very fast indeed. So let's see what happens. They come down to turn 11. Tremblay on the high side. Now, this is where Tremblay seems to be really leaning on his tires. Go to see can take a much tighter line through there. So he could not do much with him there. The uh, Doug Go was the 86th driver of the year, the 93 Grand Sport Class champ. In fact, he's been racing this series since 1985. And look at this. Maxwell, Maxwell now coming right up on Tremblay. So uh, Jason Priestley did a masterful job. He said he made a couple of mistakes, but I mean, they were just little mistakes. And uh, really done a heck of a job as the 38. Look at uh, Heinesy there, squeaking by the uh, zero car. Double zero. David Murray, who was in the booth with us right at the beginning of this race, seems like a week ago, and that's a fact only three hours ago, uh, about how you've got to, you know, look after them. You've got to baby the brakes, you've got to baby the tyres, and you've got to baby these cars. And, of course, this is what happened to Silver and Tremblay. So we've got to go down to Greg Kramer, who's got something for us in the pits, Greg. Yeah, David, actually, I just stopped by to talk to Joe Varda, who, of course, is sort of the strategic master of the team as well as one of the drivers. And I said, is there a problem? Tires are, he said, no, actually, everything's fine. He said, it's really traffic. And he said, some drivers take more chances in traffic than others. And I think that there was the message that uh, Sylvain was just not willing to stick his nose in. He's got a good run going. Although down in turn 11 now, he almost went back inside Maxwell. So maybe he's decided to turn the wick up just a little bit. Well, I think that Joe Vardy would like to think the tires haven't gone off on this traffic. But looking at the video, uh, which we've been doing, it looks to me like Sylvain is using a lot more road than he was. And the, uh, the Pontiacs and the Mustang of the 46 car there seem to be going pretty good. And now he's falling back into the clutches of the Heinesy. Heinesy is now fourth. The four car now. We wonder if uh, Maxwell will have something for Doug Goad in the waning moments of this race. This is probably as exciting as we've seen this late in a three-hour event. Well, they've had a lot of caution to hit. So they've all had plenty of time to gather their strength up again and regain interest in the race. Plus, of course, it is getting towards the time of the day when the bar is open. Most of the to get in there. I know I am. And we've got to just keep this race going. Well, we have had uh, numerous yellows. Oh, Doug Go, now there, Doug Doug Go Go was taking, now there he was taking the risk with the traffic. Big time risk. Well, that's the kind of risk if you can make him pay off or win a race for you. Well, of course, what he did there, he slipped him before turn seven. Now we're coming to these S's, which are very difficult to overtake it. So now he's left the guys that are immediately pursuing him sort of to hang out in the dry there behind the slower cars as they go to these very fast S's. A good place to pick up time, except, of course, the 46 cars slip through and down. Oh, we're still waiting to see if Scott Maxwell will have something for Doug Goad in the waning moments of this event at Sears Point Raceway. We'll come back and find out.
guys are saving the best till last here at Sears Point. And look at that, the 71 car. Back up in front, there's been some great battling, banging, crashing, nerfing. So Tremblay has uh, reassumed the top spot. There is the battle for second, and there goes Heinrichsy up to second position. And Doug Goes is running really right off the pace. He had uh, had a big back match with the 46 car when he already pulled off the road, so they had a huge back match together. Doug has done Doug Goes' car, and just pulled edge to the fourth car, put the wheel right over the edge. Yeah, go hit it for the pit lane. I think Goes hit it for the pit. We approach the final 10 minutes of this event. Will Bain Tremblay back up in front. Yeah, Goat is hit it for the pit lane. And he looked like he, Calvin, go on. I think he instigated that contact, Calvin. Okay, well, they're changing the left front, uh, left front tire as we speak. Obviously a problem there. May have been contact or a punch and late in the going here. Obviously, they had a great run going here with Craig Conway doing the initial stint in the car, and Doug Goode really pushing hard, getting the car to the front, but obviously, they've been battling hard, and there's obviously been some contact, as we see Scott Maxwell bringing the number 46 car in with a lot of right side damage further down pit lane. Meanwhile, the team are really struggling to get this left front off. It looks like they've actually damaged the uh, wheel stud here, and they cannot get the uh, tire off. It looks like they're going to keep the original one back on. They're putting the lug nuts back on, and obviously a very costly pit stop for this number two car. Well, there is the battle. You watch the battle for second position. We also understand the 46 car is in the pit lane, Greg. Yes, yeah, big time smoke boiling off. It's an exceptionally hot rubber that just came off of the right side of the car, the right front. Tire absolutely crashed and damaged to the left front. I don't think that was involved in this incident. Oh, Maxwell absolutely drops the hammer when he checked out. Apparently just that tire went down and it looked like he cut the sidewall due to the contact. Apparently more action out on the track, guys. Well, I guess so. There's a car upside down. The safety car is already there, and we cannot even tell you the number of that car. Car upside down, the driver is out, he is okay, but obviously the door is open, we cannot give you the number. So a lot of action in the late moments of this event. And wow, look at Borchella, Borchella almost yeah. got the wall. And he keeps on doing that, he must be brave and it's racing. This is actually extraordinary because we just saw Look at him on the inside. Here he comes up the inside. Now, of course, side by side for this turn one. He's on the wrong side to turn one, but he'll be on. Oh, there's some lap traffic in front of him. There's what a full done. course yellow, though. Ooh, poor oh. might get snagged for that, overtaking that car in the yellow. Right? But he drops back. So there is where the car is upside down. Just off driver's side wide as they come through turn one up toward turn two. Boy, those two guys are banging into each other now in the caution. No, it's not a full course caution. I tell a lie. It's, uh, I guess that, yeah, only just the caution at one spot. So there is the reason for the localized yellow. And again, that is just uh, driver's side right, I believe, as they come uh, out of turn one up that incline. Well, he must have got put there by something. It's not the sort of place that you would normally go off there. That, that turn is pretty entirely driver's side right. With now just under eight minutes remaining. Man, a lot of action in the final 10 or 15. Whoa. Whoa. Live car, 46 gets in behind. You think that was deliberate? Wow. The, I think that was probably on purpose. The go, the go, the 46 and the two car have already had two and three coming together in just the last four to five laps. So you. You've got to think that that was delivered, yes. Wow, so he goes now. Now it's really goaded. He's, he's, <laughs> he's off after the 46 car now. Wow, I hope we've got the video running after this race, though, because this could be a replay of the uh, Madison Square Garden <laughs> boxing match the other night. We have a similar scene in pit lane, I'm sure, when I play it over. have no low blows. I hope Kramer and Kramer and Calvin are ready for after race action. Well, now we're showing the 54 car as your leader. Porteller has gotten around. What happened to 71? 71 has fallen well off the pace. So the Porteller car, let's go. Uh, let's go back to the pit lane. Greg. Right. Uh, Gary, I'm standing by with the team owner of the number 54 entry, Dominic Amasara, and 
this has been quite a race for you. You've got a new driver on board, Terry Borchler. Has that made a, a, a big change in how this team's running? Well, Terry's uh, run with us for about three races this year. He's from Bondurant, and he's been terrific. He drives Mustangs every day, and he's really helped us quite a bit. So we're thrilled to have him. He really has been think you're going to be up in the fight, let alone the the win this year. Well, we had a fuel pump problem yesterday, and we were able to get that fixed, and I think it helped us a lot. Obviously, the car's absolutely fine. Terry's doing a great job. They've been saying he's been just right to the edge out there, but that's why he got him on board. Yep, I think he's doing a good job, and, you know, if the Lord allows us, maybe we'll get a victory this time. We've worked hard all year. We just started in the series last October, so it's a big win for us that we can pull it off. He's excited, no doubt about it. We can now tell you the 96 car, the 96 car is the one that got upside down, Mike Courtney. Now, apparently that car was about to be lapped by Sylvain Tremblay, and Tremblay got involved there someplace. Now look at that. We have another pass for the lead. Now the 32 car is up in front. John Heinrich, he drives the car off the track. They're in heavy traffic, and that's what happened to 71. So Tremblay involved with a lapped car, and we had alluded to the problem with the heavy traffic earlier, so he's taken out by the lap car, and the lap car ends up upside down. No driver injuries, and right now a great battle up in front. John Hyman is back on top. Heavy traffic here, they exit that very fast turn 10, coming down to turn 11, a good overtaking spot here, but look how they're being blocked by these guys. They're all having their own race. Hyman, he splits them, which of course gives a good opportunity to the 54 car to get inside. Hyman, as they come off the turn 11 there. There is your time remaining, under five minutes. But I tell you, we've had so much action, David, in the past five or ten minutes. Wow, we see more action <laughs> than the last two hours and fifty. This is a reward for you. I've never seen anything like it. There's our man. No, that's not our man. That's John Hunter. Our man Murray, meanwhile, is uh, back in third spot. And there is Borchella right behind Heinrichy. Just about a car length between first and second. Down to the final five or ten minutes. So I tell you what, we have got only five minutes to go, but it may be the best five minutes of the race. So don't go away. We're coming right back to wrap it up. John Heinrichsey, the uh, 1989 Grand Sports Champion, looking for his 14th victory with only uh, two minutes and 50 seconds remaining, and there's the gap. And he widens that margin just a bit over Terry Borchella, who rides in second position. And David Murray now is third. Looks like it is John Heinrichsey to win or lose this one. Well, I mean, it's been absolutely breathtaking the last 10 minutes. I don't think I've ever seen violent changes of fortune. Uh, Sylvain Tremblay going from first to nowhere. Uh, this man coming from uh, dropping from second back to fifth, now back to the lead. Uh, the car, Terry Portman, behind him coming back from uh, 16th on the grid uh, to uh, the lead, and now back to second spot. And uh, we'll turn around to the white flag lap. And that will be the white flag. And yeah, before uh, that, let's quickly go back to the pit lane. Well, Gary, I'm with Joe Aguilani, who's the owner of the team that currently has the car out front, number 32, Heinrich. And Joe, first of all, you said to me earlier, you said John's at his best when he's leading. Boy, you don't want him anywhere else in this team. Yeah, John is pretty awesome when he gets out in front. He just hangs the car out and goes for it. So uh, we're just holding our breath right now. This has been a real roller coaster of a day. 
literally a slugfest. On top of what happened in Moscow, with the unfortunate DQ after after winning overall there, this would be particularly sweet, I would think. Oh, boy, I tell you, the team was really needing it. They tried hard uh, after all that 24-hour race stuff, and we won there. And, and uh, all the customer drivers are doing well today, so this is good for the whole team. Well, we're about to take the white. Why don't you go back and enjoy the last lap? Have fun, Bill. Congratulations. Indeed, we watch for the white flag to be unfurled this time by after uh, three hours of competition. It all comes down to the final lap. And right now, Heinrich C is out in front. Again, he's won 13 times in endurance competition, looking for win number 14, a former champion of this class. Yeah, you see Terry Borcher. Second spot now, leg briefly there. Uh, let uh, Heinersey get by him, and looks like behind him is David Murray, who is making a bit of a cutback. Close enough, he's almost within striking distance. It is possible he could stand that second stop away from Bortler on this last lap. Murray now a fire rider. Set, but it is possible. Borchell would have to make a big mistake, I think, for him. Or it depends entirely on the real lap traffic at this stage. They come up with some traffic. There are a couple like of guys. Heinrich see. Heinrich see, uh, may uh, gather up some lap traffic. We've got a sway bar that's broken in 54 cars. The handling has gone off on that car. But maybe that's what the three car needs. And last traffic right in front of your leader. There's the rollover car. There's the 95 car. That one finds his, uh, his teammate, Michael Lime, rolled the car all the way over, wheel to wheel, drove back to the pit lane, and they changed drivers. We're looking now at uh, turn 10. This is going to be it through the uh, right-hander there. And we're looking down the short straightaway to turn 11, that left-hander before the start-finish line. And John Heinrich, there it is. He takes the checkered flag. And so after being DQ'd at the 24 hours of Moscow at the last outing, after winning it, they once again will drive to victory lane. Stu Hayner, the co-driver. Also will make uh, the walk to victory lane. Second, Terry Borteller, and third would go to uh, the number three car of David Murray. What the wild fireworks in the final 10 and 15 minutes of that race. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, it's just the seesawing for position of some jump to jump overnight. I mean, just absolutely extraordinary. I mean, about 15 minutes of absolute mayhem. People running into it. Doug goes, looks like he got it sewn up. Then he got involved with Maxell. They both went off the road. Then Maxell came back and punched the road right around at turn 11. And then we saw the Tremblay car get taken out by a slower car when he was trying to lap it. There's the 52 car, which lost its front end a couple of hours ago. There's the car class. He's a one compact car class. Just absolute incredible lap. And there's the 62 car that oh led my. for so long. Climbed right on top of the... Uh, Tire barricade up us. on top the wall, and the driver climbs out. What? Oh, my. <laughs> That's a Brent Martini. There's the sports winner. What a day we have had here at Sears Point. Car number 66 wins in sports. Wow. Eric Van Lee, Bob Henderson car. That's at the Look last at that turn, turn 11. I mean, he's done serious damage to that car and to the tire wall. Jumped right on top of it there on the last turn here at the race stop. Turn left. Well, I'll tell you what, well, let's, let's catch our breath. We'll take a break and come back and talk to our winners. What a wild day at Steers Point.
No, 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 no. He'll take the lead here. Yeah, he'll, yeah. Yeah, he'll be in the lead anyway. How long are we going to be? So I'm done then. Okay. We're set. We're set. You're going to come up on this car here? It was a wild finish after three hours, but uh, the Hainer Heiner C. O'Brien car takes the victory over the uh, Borcheller driven 54. Uh, David Murray and Cochran going third, fourth. There is your uh, fourth place car. Rice started that uh, car and Simone finished it. So now let's take you to victory lane. Greg Creamer has all the jubilant activity. Well, it is certainly that. These are a couple of very happy drivers, uh, particularly with you, uh, when you consider what happened back in Mosport in the uh, DQ. John Heinersy had to earn a provisional points lead here with this win. Obviously, that last hour and a half uh, fuel, I would, I would imagine, was on your mind a little bit, as well as a lot of competition. Well, there was a lot of competition when I went out there. Eddie said, you've got just enough fuel to finish, so take it easy, no high revs, don't use the brakes too much, and you'll be able to make it to the end. And I said, thanks a lot, Eddie. <laughs> but it made it to the end. It was stumbling there for the last five or ten laps but uh, as usual the crew did a fantastic job on the firebird and it was there all the way to the end. Stu you must have been just jumping out of your skin there at the end with all that uh, hitting and bumping and grinding going on and, uh, and uh, John was right in the thick of it. Man I tell you I, <laughs> I had pretty much conceded maybe a third or a fourth and all of a sudden everything starts happening they all say you know it's not over till the fat lady sings and that race was exciting I mean very exciting even sitting on the wall it had to be exciting for John. Well, keep in mind, they both said thanks to the crew, but don't discount this driver duo. They seem to pull this kind of stuff all the time. And we can quickly show you now the top 12. Once again, Hainer and Heinrichsey taking the victory. The uh, Borchella-driven 54 car would take the second position, uh, Cochran and Murray third, and Simone and Rice in fourth as we quickly go through the rest of the uh, top 12. The 14th victory overall for Heinrichsey, the eighth for Hainer. Our congratulations to the winning team for David Hobbs, Greg Kramer, Calvin Fish, and I'm Gary Lee. Thanks for joining us. So long from Sears Point. <laughs>